Hey everyone, this is Dr. Izzab with Integrative Kidney Institute, and today we're going to be talking about oxalate. There's a lot of information about oxalate going on, and many healthcare professionals has been recommending limiting oxalate intake for their kidney patients. So today we're going to try to answer this main question, is dietary oxalate toxic to the kidneys? So let's do this. But before we begin, make sure you press the subscribe button and the notification button so that YouTube notifies you when a new video comes out on our channel. All right, so here's our main question again, is dietary oxalate toxic to the kidneys? And before we talk, I mean, I know a lot of you know about oxalate, but what is oxalate anyway? Oxalate or oxalic acid is a simple chemical compound it's actually a waste product that our the human body cannot break down further. And the kidney is usually eliminated in the urine. Most of the circulating oxalate in the body is formed actually in the liver from the oxidation of substance of a substance called glycoxalate. This substance has two sources. One is carbohydrate metabolism, and the other one is the degradation of protein. So while our human body cannot break down oxalate. We can convert glycoxalate into the amino acid glycine. And vitamin B6 is actually a major cofactor for this reaction. So this makes oxalate a central link between metabolic pathways of amino acids and carbohydrates. All right, so what are the sources of oxalate production in the body? I summarized them here for you, and these are mouthful to pronounce, so bear with me here. So we know that the breakdown of sugar can lead to the formation of glycolate, which can also transform into glycoxalate, which eventually end up transforming into oxalate. Ascorbate, like the vitamin C metabolism, can also lead to the formation of glycoxalate and oxalate. And also protein glycation, as if in diabetes, for example, oxidized carbohydrate and lipid peroxidation from oxidative stress can also end up forming glycoxalate and then oxalate. So oxidative stress also play an important role. But most importantly, collagen and meat consumption can lead to the formation of glycine and hydroxyproline, which can end up forming glycolate, and then glycoxalate and oxalate. So all of these above pathways are responsible for 80% of the oxalate that is circulating in the blood and excreted by the kidneys. And if we look at the dietary sources of oxalate, when we think about the diet, the, the oxalate is actually present in leafy green, different nuts, seeds, roots, cocoa, tea, and healthy individuals usually consume 100 to 200 milligram of oxalate per day. And then small intestines is the primary source of oxalate absorption. But it's important to realize here that not all of the consumed oxalate end up getting absorbed. And there are three factors that are involved here. Oxalate tends to bind with calcium and magnesium in the gut in the diet. So that makes it insoluble and not able to be absorbed and end up being excreted. Also, the gut microbiome contain bacteria that break down oxalates. It's called oxylobacter formigans, and there are probiotic that can, can do that. And diet that is high in fiber was found to decrease intestinal oxalate absorption also. And finally, the gut itself can excrete oxalate. So studies have shown that in healthy individuals, we only absorb 8% of the oxalate that we eat. So on the other hand, we have situations where we have elevated oxalate in the urine. This is called hyperoxaluria. There are the primary or genetic type of hyperoxaluria, and there's a secondary or the enteric, or it's related to the gut type of hyperoxaluria. And hyperoxaluria is really defined by the excretion of more than 40 to 45 milligram of oxalate per day in the urine. So primary oxaluria, there's a genetic mutation in the enzyme that increased the production of oxalate by the liver. While secondary or enteric hyperoxaluria occurs in patients who have inflammatory bowel disorders, malabsorption of certain bariatric surgeries. In this type of high urine oxalate, the fat that is not absorbed by the gut binds with 
calcium, which leaves the oxalate soluble and more available to be absorbed. And then it goes into the systemic circulation and that increases the level of oxalate in the blood and in the urine. What about the effect of oxalate on the kidneys? There has been no questions and there are multiple data that shows that oxalate increases as the kidney function to turn today. There have been many data that showed that as the kidney function decreases, there is higher level of oxalate in the blood. And oxalate has been found to be inflammatory to the proximal tubules of the kidneys, and it leads to interstitial fibrosis or scarring. And we know about the proximal tubules, which are the most important sites of the kidneys that reabsorb all the molecules that are filtered by the glomeruli. So also oxalate can bind with calcium systematically and deposit in tissues causing fibrosis in the heart and hardening of the blood vessel. And they also involved in kidney stone. Calcium oxalate are the most common types of kidney stone. Excessive oxalate in the urine bind calcium and form kidney stones. So in short, excessive urinary oxalate can cause kidney stones and oxalate and kidney stones are something that kidney patients should be cautious about. But we go back to our main questions in this video. Is dietary oxalate toxic to the kidneys? There has been animal model that looked at dietary oxalate induced kidney disease. So basically they gave these animals massive amount of calcium, but they also gave them calcium free diet so they can absorb that oxalate. On the other hand, there has been no real outcome studies that I can find that demonstrated there is an efficacy of low oxalate diet on the progression of kidney disease or even kidney stones. So what if we limit dietary oxalate? The problem with that is that it may be harmful to the diversity of the gut microbiome and can lead to dysbiosis. It can also limit food that has been proven beneficial to kidney disease cancer and cardiovascular disease prevention, including the Mediterranean diet. It decreases the intake of antioxidants, and we know that oxidative damage is contributing to the progression of kidney disease. It reduces the quality of consumed nutrients that may contain magnesium, fiber, and alkali, which are beneficial for health. And it also does not address the root cause of kidney disease and calcium oxalate stones. And finally, it does not address the bigger portion of oxalate that is produced from animal protein and collagen by the liver, which may not be as healthy as the plant-based sources of oxalate. So the bottom line, oxalate levels do increase with advancing kidney disease and can lead to inflammation and faster progression of kidney disease. However, limiting oxalate intake and low oxalate diet is not an evidence-based recommendation for chronic kidney disease and may do more harm than good. On the other side, consuming a well-balanced whole food plant dominant diet that is rich in calcium and magnesium and probiotic and prebiotic is more important to slow down the progression of kidney disease and improve its outcomes. So I hope you like this video. If you like it, make sure you press that like button and send us any comment that you may have. Make sure that YouTube know that we are worthy and they share our videos with people who may benefit from it. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Integrative Kidney, on Facebook at InKidney, and we're also on www.inkidney.com.